animation in Clow, it can be pretty daunting, especially, I mean, you might be starting in Clow and maybe you have a good handle on creating patterns and uh, applying fabric and doing all the details and all that. But when you get to animation, it can be a whole other ball game, whole nother beast to tackle. So I want to share some of the things that I have found helpful to know um, in how to troubleshoot some of the things that you might find during rendering your animation and what to do to your garments when you're ready to start animating and applying motion files. So first off, I have a avatar and we're in our workspace right here. Um, this is one of the new avatars off of the Clo Marketplace, Mia, which I've changed a little bit, the facial features and whatnot. And I have an outfit created for this animation that I want to use. First off, I want to fix these buttons that I've applied before during simulation. They seem to have gotten a little bit out of line. So I'm just going to right click on each of these and say reset the 3D position. So they all get in their little spots. The next thing I want to do, I want to try to simplify my patterns as much as possible. I want to make this file small so there's less information to process during rendering. I have a lot of baselines here which are those blue dashed lines and I'm just going to right click on my background. I don't need them anymore so I'm just going to delete all of them. Delete all baselines by right clicking on my background on my 2D window. You can also do that with the trace tool, this tool right here, by clicking on them individually and just hitting the backspace or delete button. Okay, so all of those are gone. And I do have top stitching here. So again, I'm simplifying everything. And one of the things that is recommended is to get rid of top stitching. If you know the top stitching is not going to be visible during your animation, maybe it is. So if it is, and it's important, keep it on there, see how your computer does. But in this case, I'm going to delete it. So I'm just going to get my edit top stitch. I'm going to right click on all of these and delete. The color for top stitching by default is this hot pink color. And that's all the top stitching I had. Now, in animation, your garments are not meant to be the super high res and all your settings for collision thickness. If you're not familiar with collision thickness, this is the barrier between the garments and each other and from the garments and avatar. Um, so it's that invisible barrier. When I click on a pattern piece in the property editor over here, under simulation properties, you'll find additional thickness collision. 2.5 is the default. This is where you want to keep it. You can go down to two if you want it a little more realistically sitting close together, but this will help keep your garment pieces from interacting too closely with one another and colliding during the animation. So I just keep it at 2.5. You can go down to 2 if you want to try that. The particle distance, it's recommended if you have a single layer look, like a single dress, let's say. That can be a lower PD, a higher resolution of your mesh. 8 to 10 is what's recommended, not all the way down to 5, which you might put it down to for a still shot render. So I have multiple pieces, multiple layers in this look. The area that is recommended is 10 to 20 for multiple layers. So I'm going to go with 12 for everything. And then I'm going to select my smaller pieces and go a tiny bit smaller, a little bit lower with my PD. So um, these can react in a more realistic way. The smaller pattern pieces, as a rule of thumb, can exist in a smaller PD than the larger ones. One, because you need a smaller mesh to get the correct geometry of these smaller pieces. The bigger your mesh, you know, the more angular these smaller pieces are going to be. And also, they are so small that it's not going to make a huge difference in your file size. So with those smaller pieces, the cuffs, the collars, the yokes, and the waistbands for the jeans, I'm going to go down to five. 
everything should be in layer zero. If you're familiar with the layering process in Clo, you have a layering order. So zero is where everything should be at. So I have everything selected right now. I see that everything's in zero. The other way to tell is if one of your garments or multiple of your garments are in that highlighted bright yellow color that or neon green, I think it's supposed to be, that means that something is in a higher level that you've told it to be above a certain other garment. But as you can see, everything's in layer zero here, so that is fine. The other thing that is pretty necessary is to check all of your fabrics. Now I have four fabrics over here. One of them is just the graphic for the zipper. So I don't really need to do anything. It's just those tiny little pieces over here. I don't really care about those. Um, so I'm just gonna look at my denim for the jeans and the lambskin for the jacket and that jersey I have for this turtleneck. I already know that the denim is going to have some stiffer properties and when I select a fabric in my object browser and go all the way down to my property editor to physical properties and then open up my details, these are the physical properties of each of these fabrics. The first eight and sometimes you'll hear it the first six, but you'll also hear that all of the stretch and bending properties, which if you count all the way down and include the shear, which I do not know if that makes a big difference in the way this behaves. I haven't tested that. So I just include that in my settings that I change. You can see my stretch weft is at 62. All of these first numbers should be under 60 for this to behave like a normal garment, like a realistic garment. The higher the number, the stiffer the fabric. And when something's too stiff for animation, it starts to get this floaty look. And you might see this when you try to animate without doing this. So that's what you're going to do with each of your fabrics. You're going to select them, open up your property, editors, details, and go below. If it's a fabric that is meant to be pretty stiff, then I don't want to go too below. I'm just going to go right below 60 because that's the cutoff line. So I'm going to type in 59 for anything that is above 60. The other details in here that you want to check. So we have internal damping, density, and friction at the bottom here for every fabric that you select, you'll have this. Internal damping will help keep the fabric closer to the body. Density um, is just that if you want to make the fabric a little denser. And friction will prevent it from slipping and sliding around as much. The avatar itself also has a static friction that can be changed. So if I click on any part of the avatar, the properties of the avatar will show up. And you see here under surface, I have skin offset, which is also the barrier, just like collision thickness with our patterns. Skin offset is the barrier between the avatar and the garments. I'm just going to keep it at that default. But the static friction can be increased for the avatar if you're finding that your garments are sliding around the avatar a little too much. So we've changed the denim fabric to be below 60 for all of those first eight detailed properties physical properties of our fabric. The lambskin and the jersey are all fine in this regard, so I'm not going to need to change anything. Those are already flexible enough, so that is taken care of. Our first six physical properties of our fabrics, all fabrics are below 60. Okay, so we've simplified. We could even go a step further. Um, you see I have internal lines for my roll line of this jacket right here. Um, I want to keep those, but we could go around and get rid of any additional segment points that we have because any unnecessary segment points are just extra information the file has to has to keep track of. And this armhole doesn't really matter, so I'm just smoothing it out right here. That's not um, too important because it's the t-shirt underneath. But because this segment point lands on an armhole and that's a curve right here, I can't just simply delete it. It makes it into a straight line. So I'm going to Command Z to undo that. Right click on it and say Convert to Curve Point. 
that's going to maintain that curve um, without keeping that segment point. And these are somewhat curved, so you could you could do either. The shirt isn't too important, so I could delete point or convert to curve point. Okay, so this looks good. We are simplified. I'm just going to simulate really quick to apply any changes that we just made so everything is settled and happy with each other. Now let's talk about motion files and how to prepare your avatar and your garment to start rendering out an animation. So there's one major thing to really drive home. If you haven't animated before in this program, there's something really fundamental to understand about this process. In the library, you have your avatar menu. I'm going to go into female because that's what we're working with, version 2. In that menu, you'll see a folder for motion. These motion files that, that Clo has provided you, they are all ready set up to match the rig skeleton of this avatar. So when you apply this motion file, your avatar knows what it's supposed to do and the program knows how the avatar is going to act. You can apply this and it immediately attaches to the avatar and the rig skeleton and you're ready to go with the avatar. But it does not know what the garment is going to do yet. So before you can even render out an animation video, a recording of your animation, before you can even do that, you have to record the garment motion. So it's two separate things. You first have to record the garment motion in the animation editor up here, which we'll see in a second, and then you can go into the render window or the video capture to grab your, your video recordings. So we're going to one, pick a motion file to apply to our workspace, and two, we're gonna go into our animation editor. The motion files have pretty apt names on here. The first one being no hands pose, motion file, MTN is the file extension, so you know it's a motion file. Second one, a hand on waist, a single hand. Third is hands on waist, so two hands on waist. And then we have a dress, which means that at the end of it, they're gonna do this little spin, so you might be able to see the sweep and the volume of the dress. And then we have this fifth one, handbok, which is a catwalk pose, and then um, the avatar sort of does this demure hand up to the chest, like a almost a touching a necklace or you know grasp my pearls type of type of motion. You want to consider what motion is going to work with your garment. If you have something that is super voluminous at the hip or the waist, and a lot of fabric is right there, then a hands on the waist pose in motion is not going to work. It's going to collide with the avatar. I'm going to go with this. Um, let's go with this handbox motion file. So I'm going to double click it and to add it to your workspace you get this little dialog box. I'm going to keep everything checked because one, yes we do want to move this avatar and garment into the start position and two, we want to keep that transition part of the motion file because unless you know that you're not going to use that beginning part it's a, quite an awkward start into the motion. You don't have to have your transition section of the motion file, but you can keep it just to see what it looks like and then delete it later if you, if you want to. Keeping it at 30 frames per second is all you need. This is pretty standard. You don't need anything higher than this, especially if your processor isn't super strong or super, super powerful. And just keep it at 30 frames per second. This is more than the human eye registers, so you're fine with this. After I've applied the motion file, you can see a little bit of colliding happening with the garment and the avatar. So I'm going to hit simulate my space bar just to get things back to a settled state. I'm going to close up my library for more room. I'm going to stop simulation. And I'm going to go into my animation workspace. This is called the animation editor. So up here in the top right corner, you have that drop down menu for your work mode. Simulation is the default. That's what we work in mostly when we're building our garments, right? But animation is what we need for getting our garment motion recorded. Now remember what I said about the motion files being applied to an avatar. The avatar already knows how it's going to act with that motion. It's already rigged to understand, to work together. 
um, I can therefore use this slider to see what is going to happen in this motion. And notice how my garment didn't do anything. And I'm still using this slider. So that's the end of the motion file. And I can bring it all the way back. Boop, boop, boop. You don't want to simulate yet. If your avatar is out of the garment, it'll just fall right to the ground. With your animation editor, okay, this is our workspace. Think of this as your control panel for your animation. The motion files are right here. And I want to try to bring this up. Sometimes I have trouble getting this to listen to me. I'm trying to make this little section of my control panel a little bit bigger. Yeah, I don't know why that gives me trouble bringing that up. But if you also have that same problem, you can use these barely visible um, slides on the side to navigate up and down. It's a lot easier to see when you have it fully open. But if you were, oh, no, I just detached it. So if you were able to see all of this, you would see the top line over here, our transition motion. If I go one down, you'll see the actual motion file, the Hambach motion file. And then there's nothing else. Also, while I'm hovering over this, this play track right here, the blue and red bars, I can use my middle scroll wheel, my center scroll wheel, if you're using a three mouse, three button mouse. I can zoom in and out and that's going to give me a larger or smaller view of my play track. So this is much more manageable if I have it in a smaller range, smaller um, visual scale. So this is essentially how you can manually play forward and backward your motion of the avatar. Now we haven't recorded anything having to do with our motion our garment motion yet. Here is the button. I'm just hovering over and I'm not clicking it yet. Here's the button that we control to start our garment motion recording. And after is the simulation quality. Here's something very important. So we have normal default and we have animation stable. I have never had a successful outcome with this normal default setting. The garment gets really bouncy. It sticks to itself. And I'll give you an example of what happens in a second, but you want to pretty much use animation stable always. Here are your controls. Think of this as like a remote control when you do have your garment recorded, your garment motion. This is going to allow you to bring it all the way to the beginning, play it, go to the end, loop it, and then what speed do you want to view this playback at? Frame stepping versus real time. I keep this in frame stepping every time I do this because you're viewing every single frame rather than real time. And here are your inputs for your play region. The current, you can control what area of the motion that you want to see, right, by typing it in. Or when I change this slider, it tells you what frame you're at, 269. So that's very helpful when you're trying to input an exact area of your play region that you want to record. So this start and end right here correlates with the play region that you have to use when you go into the render window to decide what area of the motion that you want to use. So this will be very important in a second. So I'm going to go all the way to the beginning again. When you start recording your garment motion, you can fully go anywhere in the workspace. It's going to stop your garment recording for a second, but you can, you can still do it and it will pick it back up as soon as you're done rotating or panning, whatever you're doing. So I want to actually show you really quick what happens with normal default setting. And I have tried everything. I have tried it on my my bigger computer that uh, has a 3070 GPU in it, it still doesn't work. I've tried changing all the settings of the garment avatar. Um, so this is what happens when you use normal default setting and why it doesn't work. So I'm going to start recording the garment motion here. 
And remember that all this is doing, it's asking to collect the information of the garment. What happens to the garment when the avatar makes this motion? And it's capturing from all angles, 360. So it might take a few minutes to get this garment motion recorded, but see what I mean with this default. It is not good. This is not what this jacket would look like with this motion in real life. So not a successful garment motion, okay? So I would stop it at this point. And now I have in this left hand itemized, like line items, I have a new recording here. A new red bar has started and it says garment next to it. That is our garment motion recording right here. I'm going to use these little sliders on the side to go down. You still see we have the handbook motion file. We have the transition file still, and then a new one, garment. That garment motion recording was garbage. So I'm going to right click on that and say delete. If you keep your garment motion recordings in here, it will override other garment motions that you record later. So know that you need to, to delete those garment recordings if you want to redo it. Now I just did something that I shouldn't have done. I didn't get my garment and avatar back to the position, the starting position before I deleted that garment motion. So now when I try to get this back, my garment isn't going to follow. What we're going to do now is we're going to reset all avatars and garments to center. It's going to delete our motion file. So we'll have to add it again from the library, but that's okay. That's what happens when you make a little mistake like that. And I need to go back into simulation so I can now get this on the body better. Yeah, so you can see that's a pretty big pain to try to deal with. So you don't want to delete your garment motion before getting your avatar and garment back into the starting position. It's an easier way to do that would have been reopening the file because I had it saved as animation ready, right? But now at this point, I'm just going to add that motion file again, say yes to all that, close up my library, get into my animation editor, and it's going to take this back to the starting position when it starts recording. But let me show you now the difference between the normal default and animation stable, much better. So I'm gonna let this play through the entire motion file and it's just gonna take a little bit of time. So press the camcorder button. So that took about five minutes to record just the garment motion. And at this point, I would want to look over the entire recording. So this is why you have these controls for viewing it. We can look at it at half speed, quarter speed, or faster. It is recording what's happening with the material and the garments and how they react with the avatar in every single perspective. So it has to gather all of that information. And you want to make sure you're happy with the way this is panning out. Like if you're happy the way the garment is fitting, how it's acting, you would go back into simulation, fix your fabric properties, fix the garment patterns. Maybe you don't like the fit of something particularly well, whatever changes, and then you would delete that garment motion after putting it back into the, the starting position, right? And then start your garment recording over to get a new garment recording. But let's say we are happy with this. What is the next step? So let me get this all the way back to the beginning. So at this point, we're gonna go into 
the render window. By going up to the render menu, going into render, it's going to bring up your interactive render screen. Just click in that screen to start it. And it's going to show you what it sees pretty much in the 3D window. And whatever you see in this square is what your video is going to record. This is the process of actually recording out and rendering out your video of the animation. So we keep this animation editor open because we can toggle between positions and frames to make sure our whole play region that we want to record is in the right spot. Here is our render menu, okay? And I like to point out that there are these partitions between the sections. These first three buttons are your controls for stopping and updating your render. So we have update at the top, we have final render, and then stop render you're going to go back and forth between this update and stop render a lot of times. You're not going to press this final render until you are ready to actually render out your video. And this is going to take hours. So um, depending on your processor and the resolution settings you have for your video, it might take nine hours. It could crash your computer uh, or the program at least. So make sure you've put into place these sort of safety nets of saving your file exactly how you want it to start with all of your animation properties. So save everything. The other thing to know before you final render, when you render out your video and you press this final render button, you have to come from a full stop. So you have to press this stop render to be able to final render. And after you final render, you can stop that at any point. If something was wrong or you made a mistake in the settings and have to restart it, just stop your render, make those changes, and then go back to final render. The next little section, I don't even worry about. I never use this little section. These are things for very specific actions. So copy current image, save current image, show where it's saved in a folder. I don't really use these. You can know about them, but I'm not going to talk about them. This next one is a section of the properties of what's going on in your video or still shot. So the first one, and these, these are very important. It's where you're gonna make all of your specific changes to the settings and your resolution, your image size, all of that. So we have image video properties. When I click on that, everything comes up in the property editor just like normal. We have camera settings, light settings, and then render settings. We're going to go through all of these because they're all very important. And the last little section I don't use, it's only for rendering to share with um, your company that you work with or a client, all that. So it will render to the actual close set website. So let's start here. We're currently at stop render, right? I'm going to go into my image and video properties first. This is the most important arguably because this is how your video is going to be saved and the name of it and all that. We want to turn this to animation, right? And if you were doing a still shot, you would keep it at image and see you have turntable images as well, which you could do that rotating avatar just like you would in turntable from the file menu with video capture, except this is the high res um, version. So animation I want. Colorway, I don't have another colorway, so I'm just going to keep it at current. Here's the region, entire region or play region. What this means is I want to record the entire motion file by entire region. That means everything that we have from the transition all the way to the end of the motion. Or I want play region, which is exactly what you type in your start and end cells right here. So this is going to matter, one, what little section of this motion do you want and how does it line up with your background which we're going to apply in a second and after you have this motion on your garment and the garment motion recorded you can use it as many times for as many backgrounds and many videos as you want with all different types of settings because you already have this information how the garment is going to act and interact with the avatar once you're happy with this garment recording 
yeah, use it as many times as you want. So we'll come back to play region once we get our background in here and we know exactly what part of our motion that we want to keep and what we want to render out by typing it into start and end. The box that says save video must be checked on if you want to save the actual video. And how this rendering process works is that it saves hundreds of high-res images into a file, a location that you choose. And at the very end of it, it saves the full video. So I can only guess that this is an option for not saving the video if people want to composite those individual images into their own compositing software and make their own video with it. But if you're going to render out a video from Clo, then you need to check this box. Frames per second can stay at 30. Image size. This is going to be the literal size of your video. So the bigger you go, the more information it's going to uh, have to process. So if you're working with a, a smaller processor, go with a little bit smaller. I prefer this 1280 by 720 and always in landscape because that is the typical way that we view videos nowadays. And it's not making that change because I need to hit update render right here. And that will be the dimension of our video. So I'm going to scooch this over really quickly by hovering over it and clicking and dragging because I need this more so. So we have our image size or our video size in our case chosen and our orientation landscape. You can even do a custom uh, size. So type in your own width and height. The resolution, again, if you're working with a smaller processor, you can just keep it at 300. But if you want something to be really nice, high res video, then um, I would type in something like a thousand. And this is definitely going to affect the amount of time it takes for your video to render out. If you are not working on a computer with a GPU, I wouldn't recommend doing this. Right now I'm doing this video on a MacBook, so I don't have a GPU. Um, I do have that fancy, you know, M1 Max chip, but if I were doing this video for real, I would do it on my graphics card in, in my PC. So I would keep it at 300 if you're working on a laptop. For this section, I don't do anything with the background because I'm going to put in a 3D environment and that comes later. And the last little section is pretty important. It is the name of this video. So I can do leather video 5.1. What file do you want to put it in? This is also very important. You don't want to save all of these hundreds of images on your desktop. You want to keep a very controlled, organized system of saving each of these renders. So if you didn't already make a folder for this specific video, then you want to do that. And so I would want to go into a spot where I have animation, I have leather animation, and it doesn't for some reason let me make a new folder while I'm doing this. So I would go open up a navigation window from my, my computer and go to that same area that I wanted to save this as. Animation, other animation, new folder. I'm going to say video 5.1. And now when I go back into this choice, I'm, I'm going to see that folder for video 5.1, which now I can open or choose that as my destination for saving all of my images and the final video when it's complete. PNG for the images are fine. I like PNG because they're lossless, not the JPEGs. And the video format, MOV, is fine as well, or MP4 is more universal. So if you're working on a PC, you're going to see that AVI. That's just the um, native file format for PCs. And HTMLs are only if you are working on a website and you need to apply this video to your website. So everything is fine up until this point. So I'm actually going to skip right over the camera properties and go to light properties. And the reason is, is because we have an environment map here. So think of the environment map as the world around your avatar. It 
is a file, an HDR or an EXR file, a high dynamic resolution or high dynamic range image that a lot of times they are used just for the lighting information. And when you apply uh, your own HDR or EXR file to this, it will give you both options to provide the light information and the, the entire visual environment around your avatar. So to get your HDRs, there's a website called polyhaven.com, which you can download any free HDR or EXR file. And they're the same thing. EXR is just a file format that's a little more universal. So either one would work. And really, you only need a 2K um, version of this because when you go up to 4K, it's going to bog down your file. And um, you only want that if you're doing really, really, really high res. So avoid downloading the 4K and just do the 2K version. Once you have it downloaded, you can apply it just by pressing this plus button to the right of your environment map line item and go to the area where you have these saved. It's going to take a second to think about it and apply it to the environment. And it will look like that. It's upside down. Now we have activate on, which this activate line means that the light is applied to our space. And when we click show, that means that the background, like the actual image is applied. And you can see this is not quite right, right off the bat. We have to make some changes to it. I'm gonna go back to camera. And the first thing that I change when I upload my HDR, my 3D environment into the environment map, I want to change my field of view. And what this is going to do is scale the image that you see of your 3D file. You can, just like normal, use your panning and um, zooming functions on your mouse. So however your controls are set to do this, um, you can just use those like normal. And the second thing I want to do, I'm going to go and this field of view, I went back to my camera settings to change that field of view. And that, that can still change if we want to adjust this scale in relation to the avatar in a second. That can still change. I want to now go back to my lighting properties. And this light intensity right under environment map, I'm just going to bump it up a little bit to give it the overall increase in light intensity. There are some things that you will see automatically happen if you have your update render button on and other things like changing the image size. Um, but just know that if you don't see your change immediately, then you need to press stop, render, and then update again. So I'm going to bump this light intensity up just a little bit more. And I don't want to bump this up to a place where it looks like it is um, super high and unrealistic because there's not a whole lot of direct light happening in this alley, right? But what I could do is place some strategic lights in this scene. So when I get to a certain point of the motion, the light shines on these details that I want to show. Um, and then certain things are featured in that way um, without necessarily increasing the overall lighting and making it look a little bit fake. Okay, so here, here is what I have found that can be a little bit confusing, especially when you're just starting out on animation. All these controls and settings, it's a lot of information to try to navigate as is. But when you're trying to manipulate the 3D scene in relation to the avatar and get your positioning for the play region that you want to render out, it can be really frustrating because the controls are a little ambiguous. But here's the best way I know how to explain what's going on. So the two settings that are going to affect the angle at which you see the avatar and the angle that you see of the 3D image, the two things are camera settings and light settings. Now remember in camera settings, we have field of view, okay? Right under that, 
The field of view is going to give you the difference of your scale of and your position sort of of the camera in that 3D file. Okay. Right under that view orientation, you can use the horizontal angle to adjust your position in that 3D world, right? And that avatar stays in its position relative to the image. So essentially you're rotating in the space, but you're not changing the position of the avatar. You're just changing the position of the camera, right? In the camera properties, what is our angle? Now, if I were to go back to light properties, I have light angle. And this is essentially where the light sources are in relation to the avatar. Now, if I move this slider, the area of the image, the 3D image is changing, but our avatar is staying the same in relation to the camera. Where is the light source hitting the avatar? So use that to change your position in the 3D file, but keep your avatar at the same relation to the camera. I can still use my rotate and my pan function at any time, just as well as my zoom function. If you upload your HDR file and you see that there is a block of color at the bottom of your image. You're like, where did the rest of my HDR file go? It is because you have this ground shadow turned on. And sometimes it's that big, sometimes it's that small, depending on the angle you are at. Um, but all you wanna do is click that off and you'll be able to see your entire 3D image. Okay, so those controls are the most important Right now we need to see what section of the motion that we want to render out in relation to this 3D image. And I'm going to use my slide in the animation editor to find the exact part of the motion file that I'm interested in, whatever I think looks the best. So how do you even begin doing that? So um, in my own process, my, my mind tells me I'm gonna hit two to bring me to that forward position of the avatar, right? And then I'm going to use the light angle in the light properties to get the right position of the 3D image in relation to the avatar. And you want to have your update render on for this so you don't have to keep on hitting stop, update, stop, update, because this is one of the changes that is applied automatically when that update render is on. And now I'll zoom in. I'll bring my avatar down by just using my normal zoom and pan. Uh, maybe I want a closer perspective of this environment. So I would go back to my camera properties and change my field of view a little bit. So I want less, so I would go down less field of view. And let's see what is happening here with this motion. So if I'm getting close to the position that I'm thinking is correct, right? I want to test what my motion is doing now in this environment. So if I bring it to 270 and 300, this is about the furthest forward the avatar comes because I can see what's happening in my 3D window. So I know that the motion file stops about right here when she does that um, sort of back and forth step and hand gesture. So I'm going to stop my render and update again because this is one of the changes that it doesn't do automatically for you. It doesn't show you that which means my avatar is going to be right here. And there are things that you want to check for because there, there are some weird things with avatars that don't look so good, meaning when the avatar looks directly in 
to the camera. It can look really strange, so I try to avoid that eye contact. But that means you also need to figure out exactly where that that stare would happen. And I think it is right about here. And it looks good that they're staring not directly into the camera. Okay, so that's at about frame 345. And then turning around. We're at frame 564. Let's stop and update that. So what we said, um, starting at about 180 and then ending at like 550. So we, we've typed in a start and stop for this. This blue bar is our play region, okay? That is what is going to be rendered out when we choose that setting in that first image and video properties. When we chose region, rather than entire region, meaning the entire motion file, we went to play region. That's what it's going to render out, just this section, just what you want. You don't have to waste a bunch of time recording all of the motion and then editing down in software, in other video editing software. The last thing I want to consider is, or one of the last things um, in our scene, is an additional light source. Remember how we have this environment light. We've bumped that up a little bit. We've increased it right under here, the environment map. This is the world light, everything around but we have all of these other light sources. So right next to the render window, we have these lights that we can add. We have a rectangle light, which is probably the most common. That's like a standard photo shoot light. It's gonna give you um, some really good key lights going on. We have a sphere light. We have um, directional light, spotlight, IES light, and dome light. The dome light is already taken up. We cannot have two dome lights. The dome light is the environment light. So we already have that. We can't do anything with that. I really just want one rectangle light. Before I move out of this position, because you know what, you've taken a lot of time to figure out this position in your 3D environment, you don't want to lose this. So I'm going to, I'm already back at the beginning. I want to type in, um, oh, we're already there. So I was going to type in 180 into my current frame. So it would put us right where our start is. I'm going to do a little stop and update. And to save this, so we can come back to this exact position at any time, I'm going to get my custom views panel out. And to do that, you can go to display, viewpoint, custom view, and just hit that little camera. So now I can double click on this at any point and it will bring us right back to here, including the relation between the avatar and the 3D image. And the reason why I need to do that is because I need to move around in my 3D window, which is going to um, change our angle at which we see our avatar and, and 3D image because I need to position these lights. These have the same boxes underneath of them. Each light that you use, you'll see this activate and show. Activate means that you have applied that lighting source and the lighting source can be seen in your environment. And then show means that you can actually see the light source. So before you render, you obviously want to click off on that show line item. But to be able to move that around, you need it to show. And so for this, I'm going to scooch this partition over just a little bit. And I'm going to select that. Here's the thing. Our avatar is in the starting position, right? But the way that I have this mapped out, this little recording mapped out, our avatar is going to end up closer to the camera at that midway point. So I want this light to end up at that position. 
So I'm going to go back to my view of this. I'm going to double click my custom view. That brings us right back to our starting position. And I want to bring my avatar to that position where they are the closest to the camera. And that's about right here. Between 300 and 390 to 400. So with the avatar in that position, and I can go ahead and click Stop Render, I'm going to move this light source to hit right on this jacket. Because that's what I want to bring attention to. I want to bring out the detail of the buttons. And this probably would be a good video to include the top stitching because you're going to be pretty close to it. You'd probably be able to see that. The lights are the same as anything else in your workspace that you use the gizmo, or you can just click and drag it, you know. Um, but there's this dashed line that comes out of the light source, and that is the direction of your light. So you want that line to hit wherever you're trying to light. You can use the, the directional wheels around your gizmo to position that exactly. And if you don't have this exact gizmo, right-click on your 3D background and go into the gizmo flyout menu and choose local coordinate. That will give you this specific gizmo. I'm going to raise this up a little bit. And let's try this position. And with this light selected, in the property editor, you have the properties of the light. So the intensity, uh, maybe I would start, let's try five. I don't want this bright white color. I want a softer light. So maybe this beigey yellow. Anything too dramatic is going to look weird unless you have a very specific colored lighting idea in your head. But that will match the lighting here. We can just control the intensity of the lighting that happens when this avatar gets to this position. When you make the light source bigger, so if I typed in 80 inches by 80 inches, that intensity of that light also grows. So keep in mind that your intensity and the size of your light source, they correspond to each other. So you would probably want to bring that back down to one if you made it that big. So I'm going to go back down. Actually, I'm going to go to 50. 50 inch square and say update. Because I want to see how bright this light is actually making the avatar. Maybe it's too bright, right? And by clicking this custom view, it brought us back to the exact position that we are going to be in for this video render. So now this is showing us exactly what is going to happen in the video if we stick with this view. Um, I think that is too bright. It looks artificial. So I'm going to take this intensity down to 3. And it is still a little bright for this. And another way is just back the light source off the avatar a little bit. Um, this will give a, a more general lighting. It's less of like a spot light for a certain specific area. I'm going to go back to our view. Make sure everything's fully accurate. So I'm going to stop and update again. I'm fine with that lighting, so I'm going to turn off the show. So it hides the actual light source, but keeps the light information in there. And the last thing for the positioning is what image we're getting and the space that we're using in this video. So I want to stop my, my render, go to 180. So I'm going to type 180 into current to get my position back there. And I just want to see if we're using the space of this appropriately. That would mean our avatar, if this is our starting position, our avatar is going to move to here and then go back. 
So we're only using this little section of this whole screen. So what I would do, and not everything has to be centered when you're trying to direct this. You know, you're you're sort of the director of this little video. So you're deciding all the positions and the layout and what you think is a good use of space. And I might do a change in field of view a little bit, so a little bit closer up. Okay, so that would be our start right there. And then let's see where the avatar would end up when they are up close. And then at the very end, yeah, that's fine. So I'm happy with that positioning of the avatar and where all the key points of the motion are, start, where they turn, and where they go back. And I'm happy with what space we're using. So here's the last little bit that you want to check. Let's say you're all happy with this. You put a light in there for a specific lighting section. Um, you're like, I'm ready. Let's do this. There's one last section that we haven't even looked at yet, which is the render properties. And when you go into the render properties, this is what it's going to look like. First thing you see is a render engine option. If you're working on a laptop or any Mac, you're just going to have a CPU option. If you're working on a PC with a massive processor, you're going to have that GPU CUDA option. Choose that GPU. It will go a lot faster. That's what the GPU is meant for. The the repetition of, of this task. To get a higher res video out of this, here is what you want to do. All of this is going to make your video rendering time a lot longer, but you can find the balance. Do a little test first. You don't have to go full ham on this and, and make your settings ultra high res at the first video render, but your noise threshold is sort of important. So do you want a clear or a grainy image? 0.05 is the default, and that gives you a relatively grainy image. What I like to do is um, at least bring it down to 0.02, but even more so I can go down to like 0 0.15, 0 0.14, even lower if you have a really good processor. I'm going to go right to quality of light and material. Medium is the default. When you go to high, it's going to be a step up, and then very high is best. I don't see too much of a difference between high and very high. Um, there's a slight difference in light and how well it shows up. But uh, again, choose your battles here. Start with medium or even go down to low if you have a small processor. I'll go to high just for tutorial's sake. That's all I would do in the rendering properties. So all of these things that we just changed are significantly going to affect how long this video takes to render out. The other properties that we change that also affect how long your render is going to take is in the image video properties. Main one being your resolution. A thousand PPI I chose for this video. Again, if you have a smaller processor, stick to that 300 or even try a 250 or 200. Your video is not going to be as crisp. It's best to just see what your processor can do and what it can handle. It might not even like the, the default 300, so just see what, what it can do. Uh, the other thing is the size of your image. So if you have a much bigger size, like that 1920 by 1080, then it's going to take longer to get each pixel rendered of each image. At this point, I am happy with everything. I've changed my settings in my render properties. I have all of my information set to what I want for rendering out this video. And I have the appropriate name and destination to save it. All of that. Double check yourself. Make sure you did everything. And when you are ready to start your render, you're going to press stop render. And make sure you have all your programs shut down. Photoshop, 
mail, any search engines like Google, Safari, turn everything off. Your processor, your CPU, or your GPU, they need all the processing power that they can use. The other thing is you want to turn your computer settings to not fall asleep. If your computer falls asleep and it's the type that stops whatever activity is going on, then your render is not going to finish until you wake it back up. So again, this is going to save a bunch of images in the folder that you selected. And then at the very end of it, it will save the video. If it does not get all of the images saved, you're not going to have any video. It's not like a partial thing that it saves at the end. You have to have the very last video saved before, or the very last image saved before the video saves. So expect this to take many hours and you should do it before you have to go out and do something or you can do it while you're sleeping. That's the best way. So you're going to hit final render and it's going to start it from the beginning because we told it to do it from that specific play region, frame 180 to 550, which means it has 371 frames or images to render. And at the bottom of your render window, you can see this little blue bar working on each image. It says it's working on one out of 371 images right now. You can get an idea for how long it's going to take by how long it takes for one image to render. I have the time right here, almost done with one image. So it's going to take about 50 seconds or so. So I would probably round it to about 50 seconds an image times 371, that's going to be five hours, a little bit less than five hours. Like if I were doing this on the 3070 GPU, it would be about a third of the time that it takes this MacBook to do it. And that's, that's about it. I don't think there's much else to talk about other than be prepared for your software, your program to crash and you might have to start this whole thing over again. Before you render, you can save your project file with all of this information, just like this, um, to get you to a closer spot to doing your final render. If you see something that isn't quite right in here, that um, you're like, oh darn it, I forgot to do this or that, um, you're going to stop your render and make those changes and then start it again, especially if you find that that change that needs to happen at the beginning of your final render, then not a big deal, right? You didn't have much time invested in it, just stop it, make the changes, and then do your final render again. So here's what a final render looks like with the settings of 1000 PPI. We have that 1270 by four, um, you know, it was 1280 by 720 and with a low noise threshold that 0 0.014 and this one uses I think it's high quality material might or either very high uh, so this is what you're going to get so you'll see this avatar walk toward the front and I have a light source over on this side it's a little more subtle than this example one was but I want to show you something. One, the avatar can be a little bit janky when walking, so maybe you want to do some editing decisions in the, the editing software after uh, to cut out the feet and the placement of the legs. But if you see how um, what we were talking about earlier, where the avatar looks into the camera like that, see how it's sort of weird, right? It doesn't look quite human or it's just something's off about it. That's what I was trying to avoid with finding the position and making sure you see where that, that stare happens. And just check that you have a position that isn't the avatar staring right into the camera with the dead eye look. Um, so just some things to consider when you're doing that. 